So in Exodus, because a lot of people, uh, it's not their fault. We've been taught to hate just in general. We've been given certain media, certain sound bites on all sides of the equation. And it's just fostered a lot of hate, hate, hate. And it's continued the cycle of hate, which is good when you're a ruler because divide and conquer. So as we look into this now, here is a verse in Exodus chapter 21, 20 to 21. It says, if a slave owner beats a slave, male or female, with a stick so severely that the slave dies immediately, the owner should be punished. However, if the slave survives a day or two, he should get back to work. The slave is the owner's property. Okay, so you have in countries where slavery was a big thing, like Jamaica, mm -hmm. uh, like America. Yeah. Where people like are saying, like Jamaicans are saying, look, we don't want the royal family here. We want restitutions. We want compensation. America, we want restitution. We want, um, what's it called? Reparations. Reparations. But then in the next breath, we want to identify with this book. You can't have it both ways is all I'm saying. You can't be like, we're the people of the book. And the book is talking about the reason certain things even came to be in the first place. And you know what? We can see that even today, it relates so much, like, the, that we definitely are within a slavery, still a slavery system when it comes to employment, because I'm sure there's like an anti-slavery act. Yep, anti-human trafficking, slavery act. All these things yep, that yep, goes yep. to show you, like, why would we need those things if those things don't exist? So it's quite clear. Mm they're still operating underneath this kind of system. Boys. Excellent point. You know who's the modern slaves today? Because people like to link slavery to like a particular colour or ethnicity. The modern slaves has always been the, the migration class. It's always been like the class under the class. So for example, in England, who picks our strawberries? It's the Romanians. Mm. It's the Polish. There are demands all over Wandsworth. Nearly half the inmates are foreign, and many can't speak English. Are you from Romania? Romania, Romania, Romania. So many Romanians, I'm from Romania, like Nikolai and Raduta, they say they've served their time but are waiting to be deported. You think lots of people want to leave? Mm, yeah, because the money problems. Really? Really. <laughs> the salary is bigger than in Romania. It's a, it's a certain type of workforce from other countries that we give these menial, tedious, laborious jobs to. It's, it's not even menial. These jobs aren't even menial. And I'll tell you why. Because it, it's sustenance, it's food. In actual fact, we have relegated the West have relegated their their trades, their particular agricultural knowledge um, to other people that, you know, everyday people don't know how to um, farm their own food, mm. you know. And in order to go into that profession, now, you need to have a degree. You need to study this qualification and that qualification. Like, there's so many limitations to doing just a norm, normal, everyday thing. No. How do we reconcile this verse, then want reparations, then want restitution, then want to use this same book to say it's our identity and that we should be compensated? The slave is the owner's property. In the King James, it says the slave is the owner's money. We are all debt slaves to corporations right now. We are all debt slaves to the monarchy. We're all debt slaves to the presidency. We're all debt slaves regardless. I think we're not slaves because we don't have chains and chapels, but we are. It's a system of slavery. And we all aren't we? Yeah. So we are bond servants. We have a, a birth certificate. We're all born into a, um, a bondage. Tax number. And if we don't have a tax Tin number, number, tax number. You won't get paid. So therefore, yeah, this applies to everyone. So it can be argued like, like you're not different to this person or that person like you've been and people will voluntarily become a slave according to this system like they become neutralized naturalized whatever whatever if they want to come and work in this that country 
so it, it's arguable like who is who kind of thing like you can you can get the attributes of a slave if that makes sense the, this law and, could be applicable to anyone and the origin of the word slave goes back to europe and it's the slavic people who are the most um for ages, not just them, there's been many people. It's, a, a, every country has an undesirable or a, a low caste or a low class system that is based on, like today, we have the same system. We just don't call it low class or low caste. We call it working class, working class. Or what classes do we say now? Middle class, high class or upper class. Even, even when you're on a plane, you have first class. Business class. Business class. It, premium economy. Premium. <laughs> How many of a how many of a type is it? I mean, you might as well say toilet class. Yeah, the ones that are like by the in, toilets. In econ economies like right by the toilet. Well, going back to this though, there, I've always I've, it, just like the question of how can these wicked angels have intercourse with women, and then the son of God has an immaculate conception by the spirit overshadowing his mom. Uh, it just it's just interesting. Like, how do you reconcile the two? So. If you genuinely are about this truth life and you go to Exodus 21 and you read 20 to 21, it's telling you that you're able to treat somebody like an item, like a piñata. You beat a piñata with a stick. All right. And then he also says that the person who does the beating shouldn't be punished only if the person dies. because you belong to the owner so no matter how you feel about this book, this is what the book actually says how do you reconcile this and say this is your identity but this is your book it don't make no sense but i've seen people try to make this make sense and then it's just nonsense but let's continue so here's the next one service with a smile slaves obey your human masters with deep fear and respect serve them at all times as wholeheartedly as you would serve christ christian slaves should give their masters full respect so god's name and teaching won't be shamed if your master is a christian you should work even harder to help a christian by your work all right so this year is new testament and then um, it's saying slaves obey your human masters with deep fear and respect when i read this as well he talks about obeying a master as you would Christ. What does that mean? Come with that one, please. Come, come with that one. I'll say it again. In these books here, he talks about obeying your slave master as you would obey Jesus Christ or Christ the oil. <laughs> yeah, but what does it what does that even mean? To obey this master as you would Christ, the Son of God. What does that mean? It's basically telling you to see your master, like your slave master as God. Say, now listen, say that again. Because people, it's old and new. I've just showed you old. This is new. We can't, and this is why I, I have to say this. We can't be angry with no one if we're still up into these Abrahamic books. This is indirectly telling you to do. Obey your slave master as if they were God. And now I can see why... We think it's like very strange when we have this profile saying, if it wasn't for slavery, we wouldn't know the Bible. I'll be in Africa worshipping a tree. That's some... The ignorance from people when it comes to this Bible. And I, I throw myself in that same arena, yeah? Because when I was reading this book, I was genuine, sincere. I thought it was all historical. I realised it wasn't historical. I had to... It hurt, you know, it's like, yo, I've been betrayed. This book has been lying to people, but it's telling you not to be a false witness, but it's a false witness in and of itself. And then when you try to say to people, look and read the thing for what it's saying, they're so scared. Like, I've never realised how scared people are of this book, you know? And this is why, okay, seeing it from a different perspective then, if you are to see your sleep, if you, okay, you, this is assigning the character of a god to a human being on earth, right? And we've already discussed already that um, God is like a system, a government, different types of, you know, you're Lord. a god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So therefore, this is saying the person that you work for, 
your line manager, yeah. your employer, hey, bring it out. is your God. And, and, and oftentimes we see, you know, your employer mistreat you or, you know, you might experience discrimination or stereotyping because of, you know, or profiling or you treat it harshly in comparison with Jamie or Karen or Becky in, in the workplace. So when you read this, you get some people that like irrespective of being called xyz they were like oh it's okay i'll do anything for a pay rise or anything like to get recognition especially certain low lower class this is excellent for a boss if you're a boss and you know that this person's a christian or this person's a hebrew or this person believes in the bible and you can treat them like dirt you know you know they're morally compelled based on their book fallacy that they have to withstand any suffering as a serpent of christ because they're not serving you they're serving the christ in you because servants obey your masters as you would christ so you know when people apply for jobs there's this one job and they wanted to know if you were a christian and you know what work it was it was to work as um a carer in a in a home and they wanted to know if you were a Christian and they only wanted to hire Christians. Now, when I first heard this, uh, my friend was telling me, I was like, they only want Christians, even though that's kind of, um, what's it called? Uh, discriminatory or it's a bit of a, you know, preferentially it's a bit discriminative. Hey, they only want to hire Christians. So think about it. Christians, because Christians are taught to be docile, subservient, subordinate. Don't challenge for your rights because God, God will find a way. God, let God, God, serve the Lord, serve the Lord. What is the Lord? The Lord is who? The landlord, the high lord. You understand? Yeah. So when you understand that, it's like, wow, this is a powerful tool of control. And the people, and the funny thing is, they don't even know they're being controlled. That's the that's the most ingenious thing ever. I guess the people, those that are in power or going to abuse the power, feel safe. Yeah. Knowing that they would often these texts as literal texts or even symbolic texts because they will see me their employer as their master the comparison to your employer as christ is it's deep that's why we all almost like so, so, sorry sorry so, so technically yeah you're supposed to love your 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 wait 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 you're supposed to love your boss as, as God or the son of God or Christ, you know. You know that is psychologically that you are supposed to go to work and if the boss says yo, oh, you say, John, how Because I want to serve Christ best. And even though you punch it in my face. You know what? You can see this now as a reason for all the hardships and, and actually not, not all of them, but the challenges the, um, within a relationship, a marriage. Yeah. Where some men think you respect your employer more than you expect, respect me. Mm. Because according to this upbringing, this brain dirty, I was going to say brain, brain dirty, man. You know, you are to, you are to treat the slave master, your employer. As God? As, as but God, man. But the, God, <laughs> sure, but the, the same book is telling you that your husband is the, listen, breed, the head of the house. Like, it's listen, conflicting. Listen, this book says don't bow down to angels. You're not supposed to bow down to angels. That's angel worship. But your boss is Christ. And it's just the same as the plantation because listen. the slave master would sleep with the, the husband's wife. Listen. Uh, madness have i been read this is why i'm so like i'm like i'm passionate about this side now like nah that other side was good bro I was but now i'm like nah i can't stay in that mode and people don't like that they're like what's happened to you i've seen sense man seen sense. that's it yeah i'm not saying i didn't see sense before but i was conditioned to see everything as historical to do all the damage control for the bible because this that the other but as i look at this thing for what it is instead of why it isn't it's a madness. So, please correct me if I'm going off on one. And then it, there's other levels as well. Like, you can see why, again, there's challenges within a marriage relationship when I've, I've, I've heard it, like when the woman finds Christ. Yo, there are women that find Christ so crazy, you know? 
and the husband's like I'm gonna pray for him and the woman's like oh and the man's like oh you're going to church you're gonna you're listening to that pastor and, da, 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 and you're bringing that next round that's a good point do you know who do you know you know okay 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 on the economic level the Christ that you serve is your boss right mm -hmm. so your boss is supposed to be God that's what he's saying let's just use lame even when they say layman's term do you know what a layman's term is layman. breaking it down for someone in the church who's that who doesn't understand the church like they like the local you have class in church you know mm -hmm. you have bishop archbishop and then you have layman he's at the bottom yeah you're not supposed to know nothing but pay the tithe and pay the money all right you have, you have the physical man mm -hmm. the man you know that you have to work for because he is God, right? He pays your wages. Without him, you're dead. Then there's the spiritual man. And like what you just said there, like how men, husbands, feel a way that their woman go church, find Christ, and turn crazy with the pastor and Christ, but they don't listen or they, they distance themselves from the man, their husband, who they've known before they met Christ, before they met church, before they met the, before the pastor, right? Uh, so the spiritual boss is the pastor. So indirectly, People are worshipping pastor as Christ because he's the spiritual boss. You understand? He's the spiritual master. Mm -hmm. You get me? When you start making them connections, you're like, this is why people can't see the, the, the smoke from the rain. Sorry, sorry. John just made a good point. He's a vicar of Christ. Mm. You see? That's the Pope, the name you see? That's, you know? So you have the boss man at work. And this is the thing. If you are being mistreated at work, you shouldn't even be a part of a union. You shouldn't be a part of no trade union. You shouldn't be part of no union because what you're doing then, you're upsetting God because God put that boss in your life to challenge your faith. That's what it says. That rotten guy who oppresses you to challenge your faith. And when you faithfully serve him for Jesus, you're serving Jesus. What a Rain. Dirty and... So you got people that say, yeah, I'm just going to suffer. I'm not being paid the same as everybody else, but Jesus says, and I, no. Talking about obscenity, man. And the boss knows, oh, oh, the uh, job of quality form. I've got five Christians coming in. Oh, five Hebrews. Oh, them Saturday guys. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I'm gonna. When it comes to Saturday, I'm gonna pressurize them to do Saturday stuff. You get me? Like, if it was a, you're just like, yeah, I've got these people on lock. Yeah, man. And, and make them feel guilty. Like, make them choose between their faith. They're going to come in on Saturday and get double pay. And I know, and I know that, Yo. oh, and I know that, that Michael's going to have a, a, a baby soon and he really needs the money. So I'm going to ask him and roll to him to come in on a Saturday. But I know that he's a Hebrew and they've got a. Listen, listen, and then when you understand that the whole Saturdays, the whole concept of the seventh day is a Babylonian concept, and then you have this book that gets you to demonize Egypt, but you've got an Egyptian god called Yahweh or Aya, that gets you to demonize Babylon, it gets you, to, but you've got all these Babylonian systems within the Bible, it gets you to demonize Iran, and consequently, subsequently, we're now battling with Iran, you get me? So all these enemies of the Bible become your enemies, and all the scripts, of, the scripts become your history, your reality, but then when we start reading it and breaking it down, it doesn't make a lot of sense and what i don't get either, please correct me if i'm wrong right? right the law the government in place you know universally is based on the bible it's you no know, western culture western in particular culture. western culture the foundation of western culture is the bible especially in england it was the bible right in america it was more torah in so it, trust. Yeah, yeah it was kind of like a torah then it evolved into more like new testament but the foundation of American constitution is Moses and the Exodus. According to not me, but Harry Truman, the president who started the um, repopulation of what is known as Israel. Yes. So if you like, but the law, I don't know, the laws that you get about like civil laws, however, contradict the foundations of the law that up in the first place so if you're a faithful christian technically speaking i would you know what if you're a boss you would love to have a, a, you should you shouldn't be held accountable like this if you're a christian or not forget the christian term because people like to say i'm not a christian i'm a hebrew but you you, you whatever you want to be abrahamic but abrahamic faith, faith yeah abrahamic faith quote unquote bible quote unquote quote unquote 
Bazora. Like, I want to put everybody into that encapsulation. I don't want people to wiggle out like, I'm a, I'm a Hebrew Israelite, I'm a Christian. No, you're all the same thing, right? So it would be amazing. Like, if I was a boss right now, and play about three Hebrew Israelite guys, maybe five Christians, maybe two Muslims. I know Muslims, they got the Friday commitments. I know all these religions, when it comes to spring, have a little spring commitment, Passover, Ramadan, incidentally, on purpose, they coincide with pagan festivals but that's another story for another day so i'll catch now because i can mistreat this christian and if he overslips the line i can say you're not even a good christian because you're supposed to be obedient to me bro that's what happens though that's the reality and this is why i'm saying no one called this no color group to me no ethnicity to me if you're in this that made the colors do what they did the ethnicity is act the way they do because they this is the main, this is the framework, you get me? This is the foundation of the faith. But what have we been building on? This is sun. This, this is crazy. So if it's saying that you should have no other gods before Yahweh, 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 okay, whoever name is, then how do, what is this? You said, okay, so what you're saying is if the Bible the 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 the, the, uh, the first commandments have no other gods before me but then you can make your employer a shadow of christ a type of christ a figure of christ a symbol of christ the heck is that what you're saying it doesn't make sense because and, and, and another thing i heard as well is that some of these people that were indoctrinated into this belief system they happily went on to um they happily enabled themselves to be exploited so when they were caught they said look if jesus destines me to be sold then i can't kick against jesus mm. if god destines it to be so i can't kick against god of the bible and i have to say god of the bible because i believe there's a creator but he's not limited to this contradictory bible yeah he's he's, he's not bound by, by this bible that romans and alexandrians and the bible and germans and all kinds of I people wrote lord told moses tell the israelites this if a man suspects his wife has sinned and become impure by having sex with another man he must take her to the priest with a grain, right. with a grain offering the priest will force the woman to stand before the lord he will take some dirt from the floor of the holy tent and add it to some special water in a clay jar he will loosen her hair and force the woman to promise to tell the truth if you have committed no sin this potion will cause no harm but if you have sinned against your husband and drink this water your baby will die inside you you will never be able to have children ever again and the lord will curse you so that others will speak evil of you mercy the priest will wash these words off his scroll into the water and force the woman to drink the potion regardless of the outcome the husband will not be guilty of anything but if the amen. Woman has sinned, amen can we get an amen come on amen for that if the woman has sinned she will suffer greatly and her unborn baby will die inside her this is the law ain't that murder listen in this book anything goes so you know Anything can go so. And you have some crazy paranoid men out there that just... Anyway, and this is the law, you know. Anyway, let me continue. So, he will lose her hair, force the woman to promise to tell the truth. So you're forcing her to tell the truth. If you have committed no sin, this potion will cause no harm. So what is this thing? This is a... Yes, this potion is the poison. It's a poison. What if she was telling the truth, but the potion went wrong? If you didn't add, too, if you added too much salt and not enough pepper, this is going on. Thou shalt not kill a person. So the priests are just killing them. Kill after the baby them, and you're they talking about <laughs> and you're talking about Enoch and the evil angel made them smoke the embryo in the womb, and you're saying our uh, Planned Parenthood. This is some Planned Parenthood thing because just, just, a man just has to have a suspicion. The woman goes through all this humiliation ritual. And if she passes the humiliation ritual, the baby don't die. No husband, he don't even get punished. Like, she can't divorce him. He can't do nothing. Disclaimer, this is not to freak out anybody. If two men are fighting and a wife tries to rescue her husband from being beaten and touches the private part of the other man, you shall cut her hand. Do not show her any pity. Darn woman. I won't leave that on the screen too long, you'll free people out. Again, this is not to promote hate. This is just to promote, you better think, you know, you better think sharp. All right, back to this, so boom. Women, 
What are we saying, man? And you know how many women love this book, you see? Did you love this book? Yes. Me love this book too, you know? When I realized certain things no go so, I said, cheese, what is this? Bro, you think I want my daughter being submissive to this folly? Are you crazy? Do we have any dads out here, like any real dads? Not like dads that just can't see the grass between the trees. But do we have any dads who are like locked? Oh, wait, let me say it like this. Do we have any righteous dads according to the Bible? <laughs> do we have any lots? And then do we have any unrighteous dads that are not according to the Bible? Because according to the Bible, Lot is a righteous man who tried to give his daughters away to some, anyway, you know the story. Or do we have any unrighteous men, not according to the Bible, who wouldn't do what righteous Lot did? Just a question. You work it out. Tore those boys to pieces. On Elisha's way to Bethel, some boys made fun of him, saying, Go ahead, you bald head. Go ahead, baldy. Elisha turned around, looked at them, and issued a curse in the name of the Lord, bringing two bears out of the woods to tear forty-two of the boys to of the boys to pieces. That's where I learned the the word gold. They were golding him. They were golding him. They were golding him. And um... all right, I'm not gonna leave that on there too too long because that's a little bit graphicano, you know. Um, but the thing is, yeah, in my opinion, just just yes or no. All right. Did man like E Lie or L Elisha sounds like a Canaanite name, but did man like Elisha, who was um the apprentice of Elijah, did the guy have a bold head? Yes. All right, cool. So he had a bold head, and this was at Beth L. All right. On his way. On his way to Beth L. What does Beth L? The house of Al or the bread of Al, I don't know, but it's something to do with Al. So, he's on his way to Ephel and allegedly had a bald head, like he said. The children, did they tell a truth or a lie? Yes, they told the truth. They called it, if he was bald, then they were telling the truth. Can you imagine the pastor comes to church in his Lexus? Oh, or maybe his former. Where you going with this? <laughs> just imagine, just. If you will, the pastor comes to church in his Lexus, his Rolls Royce, his Range Rover, or maybe he's a little bit humble and he's got a Bugatti. But essentially, the pastor comes to church, or the more, the Hebrew more with the beard and fringes and all that Moses Exodus stuff. He comes to the church and that. The usher boy says, Pastor, Pastor, you look bold, Pastor. Yeah. Pastor brushes it off. That's just one, one child saying that. Then 42 different youths say, Pastor, yeah, look. And our pastor's vectional, and he goes up to the front of the church and he makes a whole sermon about these 42 children, but like for this in his bald head. So imagine that, you know, these boys didn't tell a lie. The guy clearly had a bald head and he clearly had some insecurities, which is cool. Like you have a bald head, customarily your people are supposed to have their hair in a certain way. You feel a little bit sensitive due to your vulnerability of your bald head. The bald head. I like bald head people. All bald lives matter. You get me? So this guy here has a bald head. The children, quite sharp. It's quite quick. The children here, the children here, you know, they just say, yo, our grand prophet Elisha, bald head. I don't know how they said it exactly, but I'm assuming they were Jamaican. So they say, Wagwan Elisha, bald head. And then he just cursed them. And then not only cursed them, yes, the, the Lord was on side with him. So he, the Lord helps him. Listen, that's some sick stuff. So, not. The Lord was his was his um, companion. Because all he did was say he was vexed and he, he cursed them. But the God or the Yahweh person or whoever it was, he followed through with the execution by getting the bears to eat them. Now, but real talk though, how do you even, how do you teach this seriously with a serious look on your face to your children? Like, how do you teach this with a serious, have we got any real dads? Like just, or moms, I love moms too, moms and dads. Do we have any real people in the community to say them things. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Bit spicy. Bit so sore topic. All right. Boom. Next one. Say by the blood. You want to read this one? As they camped overnight, the Lord tried to kill Moses, but Zipporah used a sharpened stone and cut off their son's foreskin and rubbed the bloody ring on Moses's feet, saying, "You are now my bridegroom." This made the Lord leave Moses alone. Ah. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, so self-mutilation to I, honor the gods. Um, I don't. People are free to do what they want to do to their own persons. Okay. Yeah. So this whole concept of this self-mutilation is an Abrahamic mosaic tradition. All right. Now people will argue and say it is cleaner than the alternative. So we were born into a world where we need to give this little part of our body mutilated. That means to be chopped off. All right. So we came into the world with a deficiency, maybe, or maybe this is the sign, isn't it? It's the token that we are set apart, consecrated, and so on and so forth. So it's interesting. So I'm not going to argue about the hygiene element or it's less hygienic, more hygienic. As it stands, the Yahweh person likes certain people in a certain way as it relates to the Dangalanga. All right. And if your Dangalanga isn't Dangalangaling in a certain Dangalanga way, then he's going to be upset because you're not representing him by the Dangalanga. All right. So people are supposed to see your Dangalanga and be like, look, you're definitely a part of the Mandem. Because that's the sign, isn't it? Sign is what you see. So you, what, you're supposed to expose yourself. I don't know what it is, but and this is another thing too. Many cultures, especially in Africa, practice circumcision-like practices, and some of them do do circumcision because Africa's been colonized by Arabs and Christians and Jews or so the Abrahamic religions entirely for many years. So they have certain practices, and they swear that it's more hygienic. I don't care about the hygiene element. And there's other cultures too, the Egyptians. Um, had a form of what you might call a circumcision. Many nations had this like rite of passage for men, which kind of correlated with the Dangalanga, right? As a form of ritual. I don't know if all of them did the mutilation thing though. Like some of these um, indigenous tribes, they do some kind of special wrapping and then they take the wrapping off at a certain age and it's supposed to elongate the Dangalanga. I don't know. Yes, yeah, so a lot of people have a lot of like things to do with this Dangalanga. Um, I think it was the uh, Khazars as well. They never used to worship God and they said that they were wild people. And their, 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 their um, understanding of God was, they said, look, I have never seen a God, but I know I came from my dad. And I came from my dad's Dangalanga. So they idolized the Dangalanga from that perspective. Like, I don't, I've never seen this God, but I've seen my dad. You understand? So that's why they, and a lot of cultures have like things regarding this topic. Yeah. So it's just interesting. But um, this whole practice of doing this is, is, is a common thing that many different people have done. It's not an exclusive um, Hebrew Abrahamic thing. In fact, I think the Ethiopians, they take it a step further. Like before they were colonized by the Christians, blah, 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 blah. They do female. They do female genital mutilation, yes, yes. and it's supposed to stop this the sexual sensation of a woman, so she doesn't become sexually deviant. Live by faith, die by faith. If anyone is sick, call the leaders of the church and let them pray over him and anoint him with the oil. Ooh, the they love the oil, man. <laughs> the shaman. <laughs> Sorry, that could be olive oil. There's two oils actually. There's one that's olive oil, and there's one that's shaman. Um, well, we'll leave that for another day. Prayer offered in faith will heal the sick. The Lord will cure the sick. And if they have committed any sins, they will be forgiven. Jesus said, your faith has cured you. Go in peace, be cured. Do you know how many people have died when science has provided a cure? When I say a cure, I mean it's just provided botany, botanist. People who use nature to heal people. They use a certain flower, a certain herb. But people say, no, I don't want that flower, that herb. I don't want this, I don't want that. He will heal me by his stripes. I'm healed, and it's like, bro. But I can see the gangrene, like, is increasing every day that you're being faithful. But I have a little flower in here that could probably help you, you know. So, and then you have the apocrypha that will tell you to have herbs and have flowers and all this kind of stuff. And That's what they're so they take certain books out, but that don't think oh, because they took the book out is special necessarily because. Even the book of Maccabees is legendary, it's mythological. A lot of these books, they're not what, they, what you think they are. And um, it's just interesting when you start to question the narrative. So a lot of people have gone to early graves because they haven't taken a leap of faith in medicine. Notice I didn't say poison. We just showed you what who were, <laughs> we just showed you the poison stuff. 
Um, where's that poison stuff? We showed you the poison stuff. Mm. But just medicine, man. I know about Adventists, they try to spook you from taking any kind of medicine. Don't use medicine. But hold up. If the creator gave us faculties to be able to identify certain properties and to mitigate these properties from becoming radical in the body, and you don't use that information to your advantage, then you're a fool. All right, so let's continue. Sticks and stones. In the wilderness, a man was discovered picking up a stick on the Sabbath day. It was taken before the assembly and the Lord told Moses, this man must be put to death. Everyone must take him outside the camp and stone him. So they did. So this guy was picking up sticks on the Sabbath day and he was stoned and he got stoned. And yeah. Now, I remember I used to do damage control for this verse because I was like, yeah, man, you know, the God spoke to them with his voice. He wrote it with his finger. They were all of one accord. They all said, I do. They all married um, God, essentially. And then this guy broke his wedding vows and that's why he was stoned to death. I'm going to answer John as well. I don't trust the pharmacia. When I say medicine, I'm talking more like homopathy, natural homopathy. Pagans used homopathy. A lot of heathens used homopathy, which is just going to herbs. But you know who used a lot of um, prayer? Religious people. They used to go to the church, pay the priest, pay the vicar, uh, pray the archbishop. They would pay the church to pray for them so that their sickness would disappear. They would bump up into a bushman or a pagan man and say, yo, listen, boil two, two herbs, man. I said, no, I mean, I believe you, you're a pagan. I'm going to church. That's how it goes. You demonize. Always question who's being demonized and where. So what these, these things popping up on my screen. All right, sticks and stones. Let's continue. <laughs> Not a fan of syringes. <laughs> no, 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 me neither. Yeah, we don't do syringes. Not all med not all medicine syringes. Look at homopathy though. Homopathy just it's like natural. Basically, things. you know that eating ginger is an anti-inflammatory. So if you've got a cold, you can have ginger. Like knowing, what, you know, drinking bitters can clean, you know, purge your blood if you've got like a foreign bacteria in your body that's like, making you ill. You know what as well? Knowing when fruits come into season. Yes, because that and that again is dictated to by the constellations It's dictated to by the heavens not every fruit you eat in certain seasons but when well you can eat fruit in whatever season. i'm not trying to spook people but fruits or Absolutely. certain things can be more advantageous when they're at in a certain season all right that's not to say don't eat this and this. Nah, it, it, spook time and spook narratives are just over we need to just think and just leave all this spooky stuff and mythological stuff alone and come into a sound mind. So in certain seasons, fruits are, they grow. And it's in those organic, natural, nature's inspired seasons that you should eat them. Not when it's all artificially induced, red light induced, people are making fruits induced in certain seasons, no. When you eat them at the certain seasons, like squashes, they come about October. I don't know the, the particular- Well, yeah. It's, Different places have different cycles, but just being in, in connection with this, the cycles of your food and how your food comes and how you should eat your food is a blessing. But if you're yes. a religious person, they'll tell you, just pray, 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 pray. What's pray? To beg. In fact, the old Shakespearean word for pray, can you give me the old Shakespearean word for pray? Um, I think it means to, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, reverence the sunrise. Oh man, what's the word? It's, um, I can't remember what it is. I'll move on. No, it's not sun worship as well before people freak out. I can't even read this one because it's so pixelated, but um, this is in Judges, where a priest who works for God, he, um, he again, like Lot's wife, oh, sorry, he again, like Lot, Lot gives his daughters to be um, dealt with in a certain way, but Fortunately for his daughters, they are saved by the angel. But in this particular story, the priest gives his concubine to the villagers and they deal with her all night till she dies. 
Yeah, sort of. Imagine that, a priest. Imagine your pastor. Someone's come to the church to see your pastor, you know, for whatever particular reason. Yeah, they've seen the pastor's homer. And they said, oh my days, there's Pastor Bishop T.D. Jakes. Or the man say, yo, Pastor T.D., how are you saying T.D. Jakes? And T.D. Jakes is like, yo, I can't even talk to them people right now. I've got to watch the NFL. It's NFL time. Listen, I beg you send one of them little church women out there for me. And then they grab the one little concubine, throw her out there. And like, they do what they do. And then Bishop T.D. Jakes or Bishop Benny Hinn or whoever you want to call it, comes out and says, wow, that's a madness. The woman's dead. Chops up into 12 pieces. Blah, 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 blah. What kind of sick sadistic stories have we got in this book, man? And then chops. Imagine that was a story today. Imagine that was headlines today. What would you think of the pastor? Would you be like, yo, that's a man of God. Or you'd be like, yo, that's a man of the devil. Now, nah, real talk though. Oh, you probably can't be as real as you'd like to be because someone's in the room and you don't want them to judge you and all that kind of stuff. But in your mind, what kind of God, what kind of is this that we're reading? Then you have a man who offers his daughter as a burnt offering. Do you know what a burnt offering is? Look at the word burnt offering. You'll be surprised, unless you already know. Let's continue though. You got anything to say on that? I don't know what to say. Like, why would you cut up somebody? That sounds like some kind of thriller, horror, horror story. And then when people nowadays do them kind of things, they're known as like psycho, psycho killers. They're that is what it is. But like you said, if this story was to make the news today, the priest gave you his justification. I had to chop them up as, a, as evidences to give to the 12 tribes because folly had happened in Israel. That's his justification. Not only that, but he, he left out the story that he gave her to the people in the first place. He, he should have, he's even the priest of God. Why didn't the priest of God go out and confront all the men in God's name with God's power. Why don't you just roll up some holy incense, burn some incense and say, God, just like Elijah called down fire, I summon you to call down fire and burn all of these people for trying to... Why didn't you do that? Why didn't you have faith and call down... What, what, what? And then people are going to say, you shouldn't test God though. Is that how it works? So you have, you have, you have this, you have this whole thing where it's like a, it's like a, it's like a seesaw. People have a seesaw mentality. The man threw the woman to the dogs and then chopped up the woman after she'd been eaten by the dogs as a witness against the dogs. Oh, hold up. You threw the woman to the... Dog. If I showed you the unsubscribe count, you'd see that, yo, man's not doing this to be popular because it's not a popular thing. So if I was a police officer, which I'm not, and I was called to this crime scene, which, thank Yahweh, I wasn't. I would say to the guy, I appreciate you chopped her up into 12 pieces to give to the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, I appreciate that you did that um, as an evidence and stuff, which is great. Um, how was she killed in the first place, if you don't mind me asking? So what happened was, I came to this guy's house. He's a little bit late. Um, so I was chilling, some guys knocked the door, said, hey priest, will you pray for us? And I was watching the NFL and I was a bit busy with the NFL, Raiders versus um, the New York Giants. So I said to the man of the house, I beg you just throw this slave gal outside the door for me, please. Just throw this sex slave, because that's what a concubine is. So he throws out this sex slave who was with him on his travels, incidentally. They rape her and he cuts her into twice. It just don't make any sense. I'm sorry. But anyway, we'll continue. Do you have anything else to say on that? No, I, I definitely don't. Trauma, terror and manipulation control people. A lot of people, if, and this is the thing as well. If you told people that hell doesn't exist in the way this book is telling you hell exists, then you'd have people that would say, I'm going to do bad stuff then because there's nothing to convict me. Mm, so then so then so then there's people like that they deserve to have this book they deserve to be spooked yeah if that's what you're going to do when you find out certain things that have been holding you to live in a right way per se then when you realize that certain things that you think are real but are fictitious you're now gonna 
go back to the world, quote unquote, or you're going to live a deviant life, quote unquote, you have an issue. So this book is definitely for you because this book will spook you to be uh, rehabilitated mm-hmm. like most religious books Iran does it too it will teach you actually I was going to say it will teach you morality but we've just covered a whole load of things in today's presentation that shows that there is no morality it's actually perverse crusades therefore go and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit teach them to obey everything I have commanded you Jesus Scripture says, whoever believes in him will never be shamed. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That's why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Amen. (laughs) Man, that's the last slide. We're done. Any final thoughts on that one? So we, uh, there's a there's a video there's a video of um, some guys reasoning on the continent, and they're saying the reason we're in the situation that we're in now is because we keep trying to save each other. And when we're saying save, save with this framework. Like if only I could just see if I get to the baptism because. We need to save them. But it's the saving that's kept our people docile. It's the saving that's kept our people infantile. It's the saving that's kept our people scared, but yet fearful, but yet scared, but yet reverent, but yet scared, but yet submissive. What are we saving people from? from people? If you don't accept Jesus, you go to hell. If you don't accept the God of the Bible, you go to hell. But then what is hell? Hell is what's recorded in the Bible. But then there's other versions of hell in other different texts and they don't read like the Bible. But you can see where the Bible got hell from. So it's like, there's a lot of scaremongering, fearmongering for this particular narrative. But when you start to think outside of the narrative, it's quite liberating. And you realise the narrative was quite strangulating. So what's your final thoughts regarding this and how this book is wickedly ingenious and absolutely incredible? (laughs) In- incredible um well it shows me that the framework the reason why this was so oh gosh it... do, do, do you know why it's incredible because it gets you to buy into the story so much that you have to sell the story to be officially saved because if you don't sell the story to somebody else, you're not saved, you're not worthy, you haven't declared, you have, you've been ashamed. If you don't confess me before men, yeah, is a requirement. So to be a true believer in this book, you have to promote the book. You can't be a secret believer. You have to then convert someone, win someone, share with someone. Don't let your, don't put your light under a bushel. You are salt. You are the light of the world. You have to go out. You have to evangelize, essentially. You have to win souls. So the system of this religion is to evangelize, to win, to win, to win souls. So To keep the empire going. Yeah. To keep the empire going. You have Europeans going out, heart filled for Christ, to save people. And dying in the process. You have Africans heart filled for Christ, to save people. Americans heart filled for Christ, to save people. And in all of this saving and saving and saving and saving, we're losing our minds. We think we're saved. Saved from who, saved from what, we don't know. The system, the system's very cleverly devised. You know, people are happily putting their livelihood on the line for, to spread this word. Like some people are missionaries, like happily not going to, you know, staying in charity status depending on handouts from people to spread the word to go on trips to different countries to places where they're not even need, they need to, but no they need this book that's teaching them morality who's to not who's to say that they didn't have morality in certain places before but people like have taken this to a whole other level 
That's a good point. Must make people think that they have morality before. So you're trying to tell me the God of the Bible, you know, the God of the Bible is only a baby. The God of the Bible is a baby. The Bible exists maybe late third, fourth century. So God essentially of the Bible is third to fourth century years old. So these books of these gods, so before these books were written, everyone was lost and doomed and you understand? So when you start talking to me about the God of this Bible, this God of this Bible is third, fourth century. This God is also made in Turkey or the Ottoman Empire or Constantinople. So yeah, when you start get into the specifics and you look at this imagery you got the guy sitting there in the middle in his eyes you can see that he believes what he's doing is right you know the guy in the yes. polo he's got his hand on the bible and hand on a t-shirt if you look at his eyes he has the eyes that many of these religious people have where it's like it's glazed like they're so brought into the, the, the story that their eyes are I've got, a, I've got a story of um, Prophet Jones, he's an American evangelist, Pentecostal. He had a radio show, TV show, he was one of the first people pushing this bananas doctrine in America, right? And these women brought him a mint coat and he had like images, his wig, I don't know what happens in America, right? But um, one of the pictures at the top of these women, their eyes are glazed. Like you could just, like, like yeah, like they were high in the spirit, but they're high on some. But it's not nature, it's not a spirit of balance and like understanding and having the ability to study cause and effect. Because that's what nature is. You look at the cause, you study the effect. I'm not saying you worship a nature, but it's just principles. But religion has you scared of nature, scared of looking up, scared of everything, except for Jesus and God. What? Okay. So my understanding then, and this is discussion with people outside, in, in like say for instance the, the workplace just people outside of the understanding of the, the book yeah that religious but outside of the bible they want people to be able to look at evidence and give a reason but to be able to interpret and evaluate it it's sort of kind of like scientific yeah but what religion does is replace the ability to look at evidence and come to a logical reasoning based on the evidence and give them a story that you have to memorize and mm -hmm. so it's kind of like you're always stuck in milk mode no matter how much you study and you come with i don't know figures and prophecy you'll always be searching for deeper meaning even though you've read the book like five thousand times and you've meditated it on five thousand times because you're not able to see the reality like like the way that you've broken it down today it's like yo I've read the scriptures. I've what, didn't you see? It's like you glazed, your eyes are glazed. Like, you know what I said? The scales came off the eyes. Like, the scales come <laughs> off your eyes. To finish on this one, though, we do have to wrap up the time as well. All we right. Had we had fun, though. It was a blessing, as they say. But what is a blessing? Anyway, we'll allow it. So, um, what I will say for this closing comment coming in to colonize so they can continue to gentrify villages and tribes yeah. now this is the thing though the colonizing person as you would call them their minds are colonized too because in their mind they believe this narrative but they believe in the narrative from the other perspective so everybody's line and sinkered into this narrative think about it look at his eyes he's glazed into this myth he, in his heart of hearts, he believes what he's saying is true and factual. Based on the Bible, circular reasoning, here a little, there a little. We've been taught circular reasoning, you know. Here a little, there a little, there a little, here a little. That's circular reasoning. What about reasoning outside of that reason? Outside of that text. Dangerous ground. It's unholy ground, right? So you have the indigenous people who are being, quote unquote, colonized. But the person who's colonizing them is also colonized. It's only the people on top of this whole framework that are not colonized. They are the actual colonizer. Everyone here is being colonized. 
everyone in this image that you see is quote unquote being colonized because they're the lay people. They're the evangelists. They're the ones who are sent out. But it's the ones who are sending them. Who are feeding off them. Who are living off them. Who are forming the operations for them to execute. They're the ones. Whoever they may be. People at the top who are associated with all colors and races that are running this pyramid scheme. The people at the bottom, the lower class, the lower caste, the poor working class. They don't have a scooby-doo. We just get fed a narrative and we don't question the narrative because why would you question your nan, your granddad, your great granddad and your grandma? You won't. But the people at the top know that it's all smoke and mirrors, you know, but the people at the bottom, we're getting swindled. You understand? What is more important in life? A religious book, the sun or water? It's water. It's difficult to even give an answer. You can disregard the religious book straight away. But as it relates to the sun and water, mm, it's inseparable. That's why in Revelation it says what? The sun will be there forever. And the, the waters, you cannot beat sun and water. It's just impossible. Without the sun, you're dead. Without water, you're soon dead. You need both of them to live. And this is why these books are based on cosmology, it's not based on what you think it is. The people at the top know what it's about. The people at the bottom, they're fighting for something they have no idea. Mm. And that's the greatest story never told. Big up. Bless up. Think.